in a row now. It's, a, it's an awesome thing. Uh, that I think, Bob, you were expected to speak an hour. And people had flights uh, to leave at noon. And not a person left this oversold room, standing room only. Uh, I think you must have gone on at least for two hours. I'm sorry. But it was the first time. Uh, most of us, I think any of us, had heard it perhaps one of your, your first times you had really framed uh, the case for Mars. And uh, I will never forget it. It was moving for me. It was uh, a, uh, something that I think has left an impression on our program. I know you would have liked for it to make even more of an impression and, and more change, and we all endeavor to do that, and with the help of Congressman Schiff, who you just heard, there is no greater supporter in, in Congress for the uh, Mars Exploration Program and for NASA and exploration generally. But, but you, Bob, have made a true difference. And I thank you. So uh, this really is uh, the most exciting thing that we do at NASA, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, why we do it. You're going to hear from a lot of people about what it is we're doing. It's the biggest rover we've landed on Mars, how hard it is. This is something that has never been done. I like uh, to be able to better explain why we do it. We often, in our community, we know ourselves and so when we have opportunities like this weekend to reach a broader public, I think we owe it uh, to all, and this is something that Bob has contributed to, uh, the why. So to me, I know we had a president uh, not all that long ago who said we do these things not because they're easy, but because they're hard. My take on this is that we do them because we can. So we are an exploring species. We uniquely are the species that explores not only for survival, of course that's a piece of it, but it is intrinsically human to explore. That is a characteristic not shared. And who are we to say this far and no further when our technology is advanced to the point where we can do it? Can we do it the first time? Well, maybe not. We hope so. But we will keep trying because it is what we do and because we can. Now, the NASA vision is to reach uh, for new heights and reveal the unknown so that what we do and learn will benefit all humankind. So we do that that has never been done. We look for things that have never been found, new knowledge. But why do we do it? To benefit all humankind. And those benefits come in a lot of different ways. They do come in driving the technology. Missions like this allow us to innovate and be able to advance what this nation has built an economic base of, which is new technologies and innovation, opening new markets, reducing costs, and being able to have uh, a growing economic base while the government advances the technology to do the next thing. So NASA does that next thing. But another benefit is for uh, the teaching of what it is that we have on this home planet. We came, we went to the moon, we looked back, and we saw Earth uniquely. And we continue to study what is happening on our own planet and understanding uh, how we can do more to protect it. When we go to other planets, we go and understand what has happened in those planets and how that compares to our situation on Earth. And of course, it raises the human spirit. We, uh, young and old alike, look at what we do, and it shows us when we work together toward a common goal just what we can achieve. I uh, was in Japan during the Dragon Flight to Space Station, being in Europe last week as they all prepare for MSL. The public is watching what we do for the first time and recognizing as it was in the moon landing, that we in the United States lead this effort, but we go for the benefit of all. 
And how amazing to live in a time and in a country where we are able to lead this effort. Uh, one of the people who taught me this uh, was Sally Ride. And being, being out here and recognizing the importance that she had played in our plan, in our, uh, of course, support for not only mission to planet Earth, but mission from planet Earth. She's someone who first coined those phrases in the Ride Report. She worked on both accident investigation boards. And for me, most importantly, she was a valued and incredibly active member of the Augustine Committee that gave us the plan to be able to drive technology and innovation, to loosen our grip on things that we've done for 50 years, taking people and things to and from low Earth orbit, so that we could spend our valuable resources on those hard things, on pushing the boundaries further, on doing those things that have never been done before. Sally lended her credibility, her incredible, not only attention to detail, but melding that with her big picture ability and helped provide uh, a framework for what we're on today. And Sally's first flight was when I was graduated from college and she was personally, I think, the inspiration for me to first recognize how space could play that critical role in making the world a better place. Now, I, I grew up in a small town in Michigan. My grandfather was a farmer who was also in the state legislature. And that was a time and a place. The state legislature was about a three-month-year gig, and he did it as a public service to provide better laws for his neighboring farmers. And I was on campaigns before I could walk in parades for my grandpa. And it just seemed very basic to me that that was uh, something that was a privilege to do to serve uh, and provide the ability to help as the public makes these decisions through their tax dollars to uh, make the world a better place. So I became a political science and economics major in college and I moved to Washington, D.C right after college uh, to try and help make uh, a difference. And Sally's flight was right at that time, and I believe was the first time I really considered that space might have been uh, a part of making the world a better place, and that it was an area I could uh, spend time in the future. So I worked for John Glenn first, and that uh, made a big impression on my life, went to work at the National Space Institute, I see Mark Hopkins here. He's one of the early people who also helped frame for me the very basics of the path that we're on, on how the government plays a unique exploring role, but it's really the private sector who takes on uh, those investments and innovates and lowers the cost and is able to advance markets so that the government aren't the only ones paying for the entire infrastructure. And when we go to space, it will not just be NASA. So I know it's probably a little ironic for you, Mark, that I end up being at NASA when that is so much of my background. I have often said while I was at the National Space Society that I had a larger role to play there because our goal was to create a spacefaring civilization. And NASA's role is really not that. We are here as we explore and, as I said, reveal the unknown and uh, reach uh, for new heights to benefit humanity, but it isn't our role to actually create that civilization. I believe that the private sector and through the support of groups like the Mars Society and the National Space Society and the Planetary Society where I just spoke will all be part of making that happen. So to me, uh, the combination of the inspiration of doing new things, the driving of technology, and the ability to inspire people to work together toward common goals and ultimately for our very survival this is why we explore. Now, could MSL, could there be a brighter, shinier example of all this than curiosity? I know we will, as everyone has said, be holding our breath tomorrow night. I uh, believe probably Michael Phelps is the only one who can actually hold his breath for seven minutes, but we will <laughs> all be trying. Um, and we recognize the value as curiosity uh, lands and starts her valuable exploration and science mission uh, that curiosity and the many people who worked on it are role models as
People like Sally Ride were role models, as people like Bob Subrin and Mark Hopkins, all of you play such a critical role in the effort. Um, to me, uh, I just think there's a lot of us who would not be here without so many of the people who've come before. And as members of these organizations, you allow that to happen, so I really do thank you. Um, although her life was much too short, Sally made a contribution that was uh, well beyond, uh, I think, what when she started out she envisioned. She was very clear that she didn't go to space to be a role model. She didn't think much of it at the time, she said, of being the first woman in space. But she took it on through incredible challenges. She recognized the unique value of that role, and she not only uh, pursued it, she embraced it. Sally Ride, Science for Girls, has inspired so many, even, even since uh, her flights, more so probably than her flights, and she dedicated her life to it. So I would ask that we all continue and rededicate our lives as we uh, make the world a better place and realize that space exploration is uniquely contributing to that better world. NASA plays a little role, and I'm just thrilled to play a small role in that. It is a bigger effort. All of you represent that, uh, and I thank you. Uh, so I really am so uh, happy to see you here, happy to be celebrating what uh, we know will be a success tomorrow night, and go Curiosity. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Yes, right here. Um, can you tell me what your thinking will be about the impact of sequestration on NASA? Wow, from, from, uh, <laughs> the, to, from the sublime to the day-to-day -day of my job. Yes, indeed. Uh, I, I joke that if you get a degree in science and engineering, you get to work with astronauts and go to space. And if you get a degree in political science and economics, you get to work with Congress. <laughs> that, is, that is my message to try and promote STEM education. So, <laughs> since I'm not a person with a STEM education, uh, you bet. It all does come down to, I believe, the resources. And uh, while I think we have great bipartisan support for our nearly $18 billion budget, the President has continued to put out increased budgets. Congress last year cut the President's request by nearly a billion dollars, and this year we have Unfortunately, the um, possibility of sequestration, which for NASA would be about $1.3 billion, maybe closer to $1.4. Uh, of course, this will hurt the NASA program. We continue to believe that Congress should and will step up and pass a budget, and we have put our budget out that we uh, believe will help continue to have NASA be the leading space agency on the planet. We will make the very best of whatever investment we are given by uh, the American people through their elected officials uh, to have the best, to continue to have the best space program in the world, but it will impact us. We have talked about uh, the, the goals of our program. We know we need to reduce infrastructure costs. We know we need to reduce operations costs to spend more on the science, the new knowledge. Um, that, that will get only more difficult, so uh, we, we of course hope it doesn't come to that, but we cannot um, overemphasize the impact that it will have. When you have, as we do, uh, such a high percentage of your budget going to infrastructure and operations, things that can't be cut, when you cut that much, it's going to be the uh, really best science that we do, and that is, um, we hope it won't come to that. Mark. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for being in charge of the NASA. And the most benefit to all of you that we really want to be in this world to be. My question is what do we as a space moment do to help you personally move forward with that charge? Would you bring me my water? <laughs> <laughs> So well, that's my personal wish. Otherwise, you guys, thank you, Bob, are, are doing it. You, you know you are. I mean, you, you taught me. This is 
um, your ability as um, voters and uh, private citizens to um, make your wishes known about how you want your tax dollar spent. And uniquely, differently than when I was uh, working at the Space Society, you have a lot of tools now to help communicate well beyond your own individual call or letter to the Hill, right? Social media. Uh, you know that we, Mars Curiosity, passed the Olympics yesterday on Twitter. Is everybody aware of that? Uh, before that, I was saying we're the decathlon. Uh, you know, this is our decathlon mission, but uh, we're bigger than all uh, of the Olympics. So communicating what it is we're doing, the value of it, uh, how it is that uh, we um, benefit the American public and the world by doing this, I think cannot be overstated how that will, will help us. And doing it in a way that uh, I think really represents the very best of, of this country and reinforces at a time when people are concerned that retiring the shuttle ended the space program. Frankly, any sort of better public understanding that uh, the space program is not only not over, but we are now able to spend those resources in a more valuable way getting the results. Now, the space shuttle was an amazing program for 30 years. Uh, they built the International Space Station on their last 30 flights, and it is from that vantage point that we are learning to live and work in space that is going to allow us to explore beyond. It's not something that uh, is a simple message, and so often it gets lost, so I think helping to communicate that uh, through all the ways that you have at your disposal would be very helpful. Thanks, Mark. Yes? Settling another planet, becoming a multi-planet species. So, who is the person or a group of people in charge of determining what NASA's vision is, and how do we convince them to make that the number one priority? Uh, you know, I, I personally, as I talked a bit about, am a, am a settlement person as well. Obviously, growing up in the space society and uh, for 14 years, and uh, creation of a spacefaring civilization is is about that. But it truly, it, NASA's piece, I think, is, again, driving those technologies and making that uh, possible, not actually doing the settling. So I know that you know, Bob's program isn't 100% NASA either, but focusing our mission on that more fully would really be uh, the job of the political leadership, the president, as well as the elected members of Congress. We have uh, the NASA Space Act, which does not say settlement is our number one goal. It talks about welfare of humanity, advancing technology, and expanding uh, sort of the economic sphere uh, of uh, humanity into space. But you could start there. You could try to get the NASA Space Act rewritten to focus on settlement. It's a legislative act, uh, and you could get the national space policy, whose goal is also not space settlement, but driving, again, fairly aligned, I would say, with the Space Act, uh, the technologies, the uh, science, and ultimately the uh, human ability to live and work in space for longer and longer periods of time. But those are the driving documents that uh, we follow, and I would start there. Yeah, yeah. The refurbished shuttle launch pad is for uh, the space launch system uh, and potentially commercial vehicles that would uh, launch crew. Uh, the multi-purpose uh, launch pad was started for Ares. They are not, not for shuttles and they are to provide the capability to launch future vehicles, uh, part of 21st century ground ops that we hope will, uh, again, allow us to not only reduce the cost of low Earth orbit transportation, but have vehicles that will take us, again, on exploration missions farther. So that's what they're for. Yes? What payloads other than Orion are you planning to utilize in this 
As far as I know, Orion is uh, the mission of SLS. They've been developed together. They're integrated. Those missions will continue uh, to expand first with test flights in 2014 and 17 and first with crew in, in 21. I know we are very open to other payloads, if science payloads come along, if military payloads come along, I am not aware of uh, plans for those. And of course, it's, it's um, a difficult thing when you have people who, uh, it, it's a fairly long ways away to be able to count on um, the capability. But I think over the next couple of years, that uh, capability could easily drive more, more uh, science payloads. Yes? Expand the facilities at Wallops Island. Of course, we're in the middle of an expansion. The, the new launch site is going to be ready uh, in not too too long. And uh, certainly this year, we hope to have our first uh, flight out of there for the um, Antares rocket to space station. And uh, in addition, I know Wallops has the uh, hope that that facility will drive processing facilities that could help do uh, more of the science payloads for future Antares missions. It is a very valuable part of the NASA, it's under Goddard, but of, of um, our East Coast facility, and I think we see it continuing um, to be even more important. Yeah? Uh, are there firm plans for lunar base? Firm plans for lunar base. I will tell you that I believe our um, lunar base plans are as firm as they have ever been. So, um, <laughs> you know, uh, just saying it doesn't make it so. And you all know that better than anybody. And so the fact that we said we were building a lunar base, it turns out, you know, I got to NASA four, four years ago. We were going to retire the shuttle uh, in 2010. We were going to maybe have a, a, a launch vehicle in around 2017, but we would have retired the space station in 2016, so there wasn't anywhere for it to go. And we needed the money of retiring the space station to even start building a heavy lift vehicle, and that so would have started after the uh, station was in the Pacific, being 2016, uh, with uh, the first lunar plans in 2028, but no budget to ever build a lander. So that wasn't really a plan we could take to the present and recommend, right? House of cards. So getting our house in order and again, reducing the cost, being able to tap the private sector so that we can go further. Um, lunar base to me is certainly going to happen. I did a top 10 list at ISDC a, a couple months ago and I said, you know, we're going to name it uh, Newt Town with a uh, nod to our good friend uh, Newt Gingrich, who I was on, the, was on the board of the L5 Society, a strong supporter, and, and, he's not, and he's not wrong. A lunar base is absolutely something as we develop space uh, that will be important. But NASA, we see our role as driving the technology, and our goal now is Mars. And when you're driving the technologies to go to Mars, you need to be able to have astronauts in space for long distances. Therefore, the President announced the asteroid mission in 2025 as a way to drive the technologies of long duration space flight and to again get us farther than we've ever been before. That doesn't mean uh, there won't be lunar missions, lunar bases as we talk with our international partners. There's a lot of interest in doing that and I believe what we really are focused on is a capability driven budget that will reduce the cost to allow us within our political system for a president to make a decision to go within their time frame of when they can make it happen. As we lower the costs and have these capabilities available, uh, a president can decide, is it the moon? Is it an asteroid? Is it Mars? Well, here's the thing. We go for geopolitical purposes. This is the government spending taxpayer money. Again, there's going to be lots of reasons to go, and I believe the private sector will uh, advance this ultimately uh, for permanence. But the government's role is driven in our budgets by geopolitical purposes in human spaceflight. We didn't go to the moon for science. We didn't go to the moon to settle space. We went to beat the Russians. So will there be a time when there is a geopolitical purpose to go back to the moon? Or maybe to go to an asteroid if we learn that that's uh, going to be critical to our survival? Or to go to Mars? 
we can be a carrot or a stick. I could see us playing a role either way. People ask me about these issues. I say, you know, it's above my pay grade. Uh, NASA doesn't decide on the geopolitical situation and the mission. We're there. And we want to be uh, available for us to advance uh, exploration missions with partners so that we can uh, ultimately settle space. But I know that the major budgets that will be necessary are not driven just by science. So of course a lunar base will be part of our expansion, but I think it's very difficult to say now uh, what it is that that will look like and drive. Um, and uh, but the, the president has said that he wants to explore, he wants to go to Mars, and uh, that an asteroid mission in 2025 is uh, how we want to get there. Yes? Is there on the drawing board a crew vehicle with EVA capability, such as the shuttle provided in lower Earth orbit, for example, say in 15 years we need to uh, service uh, the James Webb Space Telescope? Is there any way to get somebody out there and actually get early in preparation? Lots of people have uh, talked about evolving that with either Orion or commercial vehicles, and I believe uh, that capability will exist. The plans are not firm now. We don't. We hope Webb will not need uh, servicing, and it is not, of course, being planned to be serviced. But we recognize the value that that has provided as we also advance robotic servicing capabilities. So uh, again, the ability to do this with the private sector allows us maybe to be a little more nimble as there are purposes uh, and markets that would require that. I know that servicing satellites is something a lot of private sector uh, folks have an interest in. We've done some demo flights on station with it. Again, that's our role, sort of demo it, do the technology, and you can imagine even uh, offering up a uh, satellite that the government uh, owns for such demonstration purposes and ultimately having the ability to do it when, when it's necessary. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're done? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Go curiosity.